Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And on behalf of the African Events Team, teams, uh, uh, it's a very great pleasure to welcome all of you to this really special event, uh, the launch here in New York of a new uh, edited volume called Africa's Peacemakers, Nobel Peace Laureates of African Descent. And we're really very, very privileged to have with us uh, the editor of the volume and one of the authors, uh, Dr. Adeke Adebajo, currently the executive director of the Center for Conflict Resolution, uh, the former head of the uh, Africa program here at IPI, and my very good friend. Uh, I'm really pleased to have also with us uh, two of the uh, principal authors, Professor Pearl Pearl Robinson uh, from Tufts University, and Lee Daniels, an independent journalist based here in New York. Well, I, I've, I've read this book uh, about two months ago, and I read, read part of it over the weekend. And uh, th this is, in my mind, a really important volume because it provides, in a very concise way, a trenchant and incisive analysis, first of all, of the achievements of the 10 Africans and three African Americans who were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, but the volume and offers a kind of a critical analysis of each of these 13 winners. It's not a hagiography. Uh, and secondly, what's kind of implicit and even explicit in it is a critique of the Nobel Peace Prize itself and of the criteria by which individuals are selected to receive the prize. So it's not just an unqualified endorsement of the Nobel Peace Prize as a kind of an end in itself. Uh, and it offers a rather sharp and focused critique of a number of the winners, as you'll hear. Well, Ade's chapter, which is entitled uh, Obama's Noble Ancestors, From Bunch to Barack and Beyond, that's kind of a classic Ade title here, those of you who know Ade well, uh, raises questions regarding the timing of the award to President Obama. And it poses the question of whether aspirational rhetoric, as distinct from concrete accomplishment, merits the award of the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, Professor Robinson's chapter, which is entitled, Three African Americans Debate War and peace, the focus is on the word debate, raises important questions, it seems to me, arising from their different perspectives on the use of force. And uh, Mr. Daniel's chapter, entitled Martin Luther King Jr., The Great Provocateur, in which I reread last night, is in my mind a devastating uh, and brilliant critique of the America in which we all have lived and in which we continue to live. Uh, he suggests that Dr. King was not only the militant of the century, meaning the 20th century, but he concludes that he, Martin Luther King Jr., may well hold this title for a good part of this century as well. You can all think about what that means for the world in which we live. So each of our authors will speak for up to 15 minutes, uh, after which we will have uh, the traditional question and answer session. I also, by the way, would like to welcome Dr. James Jonah. Where's James? Here he is. Who is also one of the authors in the volume. He wrote the terrific chapter on Ralph Bunch, one of the three Americans who won the Nobel Peace Prize for his work at the United Nations on the uh, Israeli war, 48, 49, uh, with the Arab states and the uh, peace agreement that came in its wake. So our first speaker will be Ade. The floor is yours, Ade. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, thanks. Green light is on. That's fairly simple. Um, <laughs> thanks very much. I just wanted to, as usual, acknowledge uh, IPI for hosting the event. I spent five wonderful years here. And I need to just acknowledge a few friends. I feel that as I look out, my life kind of stretches out 
before me. Uh, James Jonah has already been acknowledged and he's a member of the board of my center and also wrote a wonderful chapter. I hope he'll join the debate since he personally was mentored by Ralph Bunch. David Malone, of course, was the indefatigable president of IPI and I learned everything I know and I'm now applying in Cape Town uh, under him. So it's very good to see uh, David and of course we were together also at his school in England as well where the spires were dreaming. Uh, Taddy I know is uh, with Carnegie and has also been a good mentor. Margaret Vogt headed the Africa program at IPI um, and was special representative in Central African Republic. And finally, two more diplomats, the ambassador of Angola, Gaspar Martins. He's one of the most experienced and dedicated and committed. The Nigerian ambassador just walked in. I have to acknowledge Nigeria. Uh, <laughs> and the Ghanaian Deputy Ambassador William also. So all protocols observed, as we say in Abuja. If I've missed anybody, it's not out of slight. In 2013, the African Union commemorated 50 years since the birth of its predecessor, the Organization of African Unity, which embodied the quest for Pan-African unity. The African Union has also designated the African diaspora as a sixth region, which is at least a recognition in theory, if not always in practice, of the importance of this relationship. And part of the kind of drive of writing this book is to try to build some of the bridges with the diaspora that we had during decolonization and even during the anti-apartheid struggles as well. The continent has also embarked since 1960 on a quest for what the Kenyan political scientist Ali Mazrui described as a Pax Africana, which is an effort by Africans to create and consolidate an African-owned peace on their own continent. The 13 Nobel Peace Laureates examined in this volume are thus, in a real sense, prophets of Pax Africana. The volume seeks to draw lessons for peacemaking, civil rights, socioeconomic justice, environmental protection, nuclear disarmament, and women's rights based on the rich experiences of the 13 Nobel laureates of African descent who won the prize between 1950 and 2011. These laureates share diverse backgrounds, but have waged similar struggles for peace, justice, and freedom. And the collection of lucid, jargon-free essays written by prominent inter interdisciplinary team of 14 African and African-American scholars and practitioners is the first book of its kind to comprehensively tackle this issue. So we have Ali Mazrui, a scholar, writing about Barack Obama in a very rich chapter that puts the whole subject into context. And we have Butrus Butrus Ghali writing a really rich chapter also on Anwar Sadat as well, whom he served as his deputy foreign minister. So the 13 Nobel laureates that we deal with in this book are three African Americans, Ralph Bunch, Martin Luther King, and of course Obama, four South Africans, Albert Lutuli, Desmond Tutu, Nelson Mandela, and controversially, F.W. de Klerk. Uh, two Egyptians, Anwar Sadat and Mohamed El Baradai, Kenya's Wangari Matai, and two Liberians, controversially Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and Lemma Bowie. Um, India's political spiritual leader Mahatma Gandhi was nominated for the prize five times and shortlisted three times, but controversially also was never awarded the prize, and it was thought that it was the relationship between the British Empire at the time and Norway that could have accounted for this. And we can talk a bit more about the background of the prizes that are awarded effectively by five Norwegians every year. Gandhi's nonviolent struggle, however, served as an inspiration for eight of our Nobel Peace Laureates, and we can also make these connections. The 15 essays that we have here seek to make connections between the struggles for peace, justice, and freedom. 
Ralph Bunch and Martin Luther King, for example, marched together during the civil rights struggle of the 50s and 60s. Lutuli and King issued a statement against apartheid in 1962. Lutuli and Mandela worked together institutionally within the ANC in the anti-apartheid struggle. And we also have other connections and interactions as well. Kofi Annan and Mohamed Al-Baradai were both self-effacing bureaucrats rather than politicians who rose up the ranks and tried to act as a force for good within their institutions. Uh, Wangari Matai, Johnson Sirleaf, and Lemma Bowie all left abusive partners and courageously pursued women's rights through methods that directly confronted authority. Both El Baradai um, and Matai were involved in unorthodox struggles that sought to link nuclear disarmament and environmental protection to global security in a new framework of human security. And both El Baradai and Obama, of course, have pursued nuclear disarmament. Over two centuries ago, Jesus of Nazareth had famously noted that no prophet is honored in his own land. Six of our Nobel laureates suffered this fate. Ralph Bunch was more recognized in international circles than he was in the US. Sadat was revered in the West, but shunned in both the Middle East and Africa. El Baradai failed in his bid to play a more prominent political role in Egypt after his return in 2009. Johnson Sirleaf failed disastrously the first time she tried to run for president in 1997, seen as being very much out of touch, a UN bureaucrat, effectively. While Matai's environmental activism was more recognized abroad than it was in Kenya, it's also worth noting that five of our subjects, Sadat, de Klerk, Mandela, Johnson Sirleaf, and Obama, were heads of states who were constrained by the fact that they held state power and could not always abide by the principles which, for which they got the Nobel Peace Prize. So I want to go through uh, very quickly the Nobel laureates and then hand over to our much more illustrious panelists to actually focus on the African-American noblest. Ralph Bunch was the scholar diplomat, and he was the first black person, a first person of color, as some people say, to win the prize in 1950. He won it for his skillful mediation in the Middle East, but he was also instrumental in having set up the Trusteeship Council, which pushed for decolonization in Africa and Asia. The great provocateur, Martin Luther King, won it as the youngest prize holder at 35. It's amazing to think that he didn't live till he was 40. And he was, of course, the most eloquent spokesman of the civil rights struggle, as you hear from uh, Lee. As the first African-American US president was preparing to send more troops to wage war in Afghanistan, word came through in October 2009 that Obama had won the Nobel Peace Prize. Some of his foreign policy actions have unfortunately followed in the hawkish footsteps of his predecessor, George W. Bush. While Bush ordered about 50 drone strikes in eight years, Obama had ordered 375 strikes in four and a half years. And by May 2013, these drones had killed an estimated 3,500 people. The previously idealistic president had been taught how to kill since becoming president six years before. He often resembles, at least to me, a tragic Macbethian figure, unable to wipe the blood of his victims off his permanently stained hands. You hear another version from Pearl Robinson of that. The president of South Africa's African National Congress, Albert Lutuli, was the first African laureate in 1960 and his winning the award was actually an attempt to highlight the brutalities of apartheid. And before then, uh, almost everybody, apart from one single Argentinian, had been from America, 
or Europe that had won the prize up till 1945. So this was also an attempt to globalize the Nobel Peace Prize, if you like. Lutuli was a priest and traditional chief from rural KwaZulu-Natal, and for him, the road to freedom lay through the cross, and sacrifices and suffering would be required to translate Jesus' love ethic into concrete achievement. So the cross necessarily had to come before the crown. In 1984, the Anglican Archbishop of Cape Town, Desmond Tutu, a troublesome priest like Lutuli, won the Nobel Peace Prize for his quest for socioeconomic justice in apartheid South Africa. And Tutu, of course, was a tireless priest who would wade in his purple cassock into crowds in townships to save people from being necklace, to have the tire hung around them and burnt to death. Uh, but Tutu is also one of the most narcissistic of our Nobel laureates and sometimes has acted like an unguided missile, like when he, for example, said that the ANC government was worse than the apartheid government after the Dalai Lama had been denied a visa in 2011. He's hobnobbing with people like Bono who trivialize African causes is also something that we can at least use to balance our analysis of Tutu. Nelson Mandela is actually the person to whom the book was dedicated. We were going to print as Mandela died, so we dedicated the book to him. He came out of jail, as we all know, after 27 years without any apparent bitterness, preaching reconciliation, one of the greatest moral figures of the 20th century. And the charisma of the founding father helped South Africa's young democratic institutions to flower and gave a country which was a former pariah a moral stature of which it could never have dreamed. And I think the place of Mandela as a founding father is like a George Washington for the US or a Mahatma Gandhi in India. De Klerk is quite a different figure. We know, of course, some of you will remember on CNN in 2012, he caused widespread outrage when he appeared to defend the apartheid system, which had legalized racism. But it shouldn't, the greater outrage was that so many people were outraged. One shouldn't have been surprised. He had put all of this on public record in his memoirs, and de Klerk came from a family which had actually helped establish and set up apartheid. So giving up on apartheid and repudiating it would have been an act of political parasite for him. Um, he did not help end apartheid because it was morally repugnant, but because in his words, it failed as a system of political control. De Klerk, however, does have to be given some credit for his peacemaking role with Mandela during the transition and the fact he was prepared to commit political suicide. But this is one of the controversial awards. The president of Egypt from 1970 to 81, Anwar Sadat, the tragic peacemaker, was awarded the prize after his trip to Jerusalem in 1977. And he had, of course, earlier paradoxically waged war in order to promote peace. And true to his peasant roots, he felt he needed to break bread with the enemy and basically talk peace. Egypt's second peace laureate in 2005 was Mohamed El Baradai, the rocket man, who was head of the UN's International Atomic Energy Agency, a man of great integrity and independence. He exposed the twisted logic in the irrational American approach in attacking a country, Iraq, that had nuclear weapons while vacillating while another North Korea acquired them. Ghana's Kofi Annan, many of you will know my views on him, and William is here to defend him. Uh, he served as UN Secretary General between 1997 and 2006. And during his tenure, Kofi Annan, of course, acted like a secular pope on the East River, championing humanitarian intervention, 
But one lingering accusation he's never quite been able to shake off was that while head of UN peacekeeping, the Rwandan genocide was warned about three months earlier, and he hadn't courageously reported to the Security Council. The point is that it's the member states, of course, who are largely responsible, but I think that the department should have and could have at least done their job in more courageously holding their feet to the fire. And he was a made in America Secretary General, of course. We know the role that Madeleine Albright played to put him in power. But I think in the end, with John Bolton having arrived and the Bush administration having fallen out of favor with Anand, he finally and painfully discovered the ancient wisdom that one needs a long spoon to sup with the devil. Kenyan environmental campaigner Wangari Matai died from cancer at the age of 71 in September 2011. She died a month before two African women joined the elite ranks of Nobel Peace Laureates. And she fought tirelessly to save her country's rainforests and planted 30 million trees as an earth mother. Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the award of the prize to her four days before a presidential election for championing women's rights in October 2011 must count as one of the most political acts in the history of the prize because you surely cannot imagine a North American or European leader getting the Nobel Peace Prize four days before a presidential or prime ministerial election. And I think there's a huge gap between perceptions of Johnson Sirleaf. She has a lot of very good supporters, Hillary Clinton and others, and a fantastic PR machine, and some of the perceptions in the region which criticize her, for example, for funding Charles Taylor's war with $10,000, which she, of course, admitted at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Lemma Bowie, a 41-year-old Liberian former social worker and prayerful peace warrior, has been a key figure in West Africa's women's movement, and I gather she spoke here very eloquently recently. She resigned as head of Liberia's Truth Commission, having earlier backed Johnson Sirleaf very strongly, accusing her of nepotism and failing to close the gap between rich and poor. So, Chair, in closing my remarks, it's important to note that none of Obama's 12 fellow laureates were in a powerful enough position to be able to secure world peace. The young Afro-Saxon president of the most powerful nation on earth is the first Nobel Peace Laureate of African descent who has a chance to leave an indelible mark on global peace and security. It doesn't have very long to do it, but things like peace in the Middle East, uh, regional peacekeeping in Africa, nuclear disarmament, environmental and women's rights are things that Obama can champion. And I started with Gandhi, and I want to end with Mahatma Gandhi, uh, the most deserving Nobel Peace Laureate not to have won the prize. He noted in 1936, and I quote, that it was maybe through the Negroes that the unadulterated message of nonviolence will be delivered to the world. Through the example of the 13 prophets of Pax Africana we've examined in this book, could this prophecy yet be fulfilled? Amen. Well, if any of you had any doubt that this was a special event, we're already off to a, quite a launch here. And if any of you uh, have not totally digested what Ade has had to say, and he's had a lot to say just now, the book is going to be on sale out there. So I think a lot of you may want to get your hands on it afterward to reflect on the points that he has made and that our other co-authors have made. I also want to, uh, Ade has done it already, but recognize my intellectual personal mentors here, David Malone and Margaret Vogt, who were uh, at the head of IPI when I had the privilege of joining with David. And Margaret, of course, was here before either of us and set up that Africa program that still continues uh, as much as possible. So uh, wonderful to have you both here, as well as all of our other speakers who are here. So I'd now like to ask uh, Professor Robinson to take the floor, please. Okay.
Since people are acknowledging their intellectual lineages, I want to say that Adi is a former student of mine. And every time I see him or read him, I'm just totally in joy. Uh, even sometimes if I disagree with him. But it's, uh, with, with, uh, with young people like this, we know that the world is going to get better, even if it takes a while. Now, I'm going to actually read from um, the chapter, my chapter of the book. It's the only way right now I can be disciplined enough to try to stay within the time, and you just tell me if I'm taking too much time. What I decided to do is, I, I actually right now I'm working on an intellectual biography about Ralph Bunch, and Adi said to me, ah, Pearl, I want you to do a chapter for my book on King. And I said, well, I don't know anything about King, or at least I don't know anything more than most people, but I do sort of know a, a bit more than most people these days about Ralph Bunch, present company excluded, Mr. Jonah. And so what I proposed to do was to do something that I could write about the three African Americans and to kind of narrow it by looking at what they said in their Nobel lectures. Because when you win the prize, you, th you suddenly have this global platform to articulate your ideas about peace. And Obama, quite clearly, I'm certain that when he won the prize, he must have read uh, both King and Bunch's speeches as part of the preparation for deciding what he would do. When I sat down and read the three, what I actually found was that De Obama was having a debate with King as well as with Bunch, a debate about war and peace. So that gave me the framing for my chapter. And if you, when you read it, you will see that I actually take uh, their actual words from their speeches and I juxtapose them uh, to sort of see where I think, okay, now I see Obama is deba debating King. Now he's debating Bunch. Now he understands he's got to have his own way. And that's kind of the way it's structured. Now let me begin. The first thing, winning the Peace Prize. Winning the Nobel Peace Prize in 2009 posed a conundrum for Barack Obama. As a sitting president of the United States, presiding over two active wars, how was he to respond? The Nobel Peace Committee's decision to honor a national political leader less than a year into his first term, before he had scored any significant foreign policy victories, drew praise, skepticism, and even a degree of scorn. The announcement from Oslo lauded Obama for his, quote, extraordinary efforts to strengthen international diplomacy and cooperation between peoples, unquote. In further details, the press release accorded, quote, special importance to the awardee's vision of and work for a world free of nuclear arms. But speaking in the White House Rose Garden on the day of the announcement in October 2009, Obama remarked, to be honest, I do not feel that I deserve to be in the company of the transformative figures who've been honored by this prize. He then gave notice of his intention to accept the award as a call to action, a call for all nations to confront the common challenges of the 21st century. Granted, President Obama was an unlikely peace laureate for the class of 2009, yet even then he had the earmarks of a contender. Speaking in Oslo City Hall barely two months later after receiving uh, the, the notice when he actually went to receive the prize, President Obama acknowledged that the timing of his award was inconvenient, coming, as he said, at the beginning and not the end of my labors on the world stage. Feigned humility, perhaps, but Obama's Nobel lecture left little doubt that the new president had set his sights on becoming a transformative world leader. So what went wrong? The other two men, Ralph Bunch, who received the award in 1950, Martin Luther King Jr. in 1964, uh, had done a bit more uh, at the time they got the award. 
Bunch was a member of the United Nations Secretariat, honored for his successful mediation of an arms disagreement between Palestine and seven Arab states in 1949. King was an ordained Baptist minister with a doctorate in theology, honored for his courageous leadership of a nonviolent campaign to bring racial justice to the American South. Even before being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, all three of these African Americans, Bunch, King, and Obama, were by any standard extraordinarily accomplished human beings. Each was on record as a theorist and a practitioner of peacemaking. Each had developed a deeply personal and highly sophisticated understanding of racial bigotry and religious stereotyping as impediments to peace. Each insisted that in modern war, victory is illusory, yet they did not see eye to eye on the relationship between war and peace. You know, there's always a tension between principles and context and the relative weight given to each. What Obama has done is to give more weight to his situation, in particular, his situation of being the American president. Both Bunch and King also were forever aware of the context in which they operated, but they really devoted their practice of peace to trying to articulate principles that could transform the context. So I refer to President Obama as a situational peace activist. President Obama's 2009 Nobel laureate, he gave it the title, A Just and Lasting Peace, targets two audiences, global humanity and his domestic political constituency. The carefully crafted narrative chronicles a persistent struggle for peace despite inherent political constraints and limits on presidential power. After expressing profound gratitude to the Nobel Committee for its endorsement of his administration's highest aspirations in the pursuit of peace, Obama pivots. Abruptly shifting tone, he proceeds to delineate his solemn responsibilities as a commander in chief who must order troops to kill and be killed. This juxtaposition of life affirming and life denying power is jarring. The claim that his administration was working to replace war with peace does not obscure the contradictions. We are left with the portrait of a president who is a situational peace activist, both empowered and constrained by his relationship to the state. A uh, quote from Obama's speech, he says, we are not mere prisoners of fate. Our actions matter and can bend history in the direction of justice. You hear that echo? Still, we're at war, and I'm responsible for the deployment of thousands of young Americans to battle in a distant land. And so I come here with an acute sense of the cost of armed conflicts. Now, what this leads us to is the drone strikes. President Obama touts a willingness to use his commander-in-chief powers to extend the hegemony of the free world, ordering unprecedented numbers of predator drone strikes in Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, and Mali, assassinations of foreign nationals and even American citizens suspected of terrorist activities in Yemen, special operations against terrorist leaders in Pakistan, Yemen, Afghanistan, and North Africa, and an armed intervention to protect endangered civilian populations in Libya. However, few were aware that when he accepted the Peace Prize in December 2009, the new president had already authorized more drone strikes than George Bush approved in his whole eight-year presidency. Perhaps this is why Obama's Oslo lecture included explicit references to the human tragedy associated with the pursuit of peace. Again, quoting him. So yes, the instruments of war do have a role to play in, reserving the in preserving the peace. And yet, this truth must coexist with another, 
that no matter how justify, war, justified war promises human tragedy. Now, Ralph Bunch and Martin Luther King Jr. had also wrestled with similar issues of war and peace during their labors on the world st stage. But neither Bunch nor King was a professional politician, let alone a sitting head of state. Their respective institutional affiliations, one an international civil servant, the other the leader of a domestic social movement, freed them from the obligation to justify the wages of war. Nevertheless, both left practical legacies that could serve as sounding boards for Obama as he struggled to articulate his own path to peace. Now, as president, Obama has tended to use Martin Luther King uh, as a, uh, a foil or a backdrop or uh, sort of to, as a way of saying, he didn't have to deal with all the things I have to deal with. Uh, and so I admire him. I admire people such as Gandhi, uh, King, and they were visionaries who had set a high moral standard and at the same time, he portrays himself, though, as a politician whose actions are tempered by their wisdom, but nevertheless, he has things he has to do. And so Obama, uh, again, quoting from his Nobel lecture, I do not bring with me today a definitive solution to the problems of war. What I do know is that meeting these challenges will require the same vision, hard work, and persistence of those men and women who acted so boldly decades ago. And it will require us to think in new ways about the notions of just war and the imperatives of a just peace. So at the end of Obama's Nobel lecture, he begins to talk about his path, which is a just peace. Uh, he couldn't simply stand there at the podium and say, you know, I'm in, I have to uh, wage war. Uh, and so what he does is to propose a way of looking, uh, try, trying to define a just peace. Now, Ralph Bunch, Ralph Bunch did not equivocate. Five minutes, okay, fine. Ralph Bunch did not equivocate when accepting his Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo in December 1950. Instead, he sought to articulate a set of principles, practices, and mechanisms that could serve to resolve interstate conflicts without resort to war. While careful to note the vital differences and wide areas of conflict among nations, Bunch insisted that there is virtually none that could not be settled peacefully by negotiation and mediation if it were not for recalcitrant political leaders who lack a genuine will for peace. He lamented the widely held belief that war is inevitable, and he took special aim at the notion of a preventive war from Bunch's speech. To suggest that war can prevent war is a base play on words and a despicable form of war mongering. There are some who in their resignation to war wish merely to select their own time for initiating it. Um, telling myself to jump to King. Now, Martin Luther King uh, was unequivocal in terms of his dedication to peace, and we will hear more about that. Let me just uh, quote a few things from his speech. King, wisdom born of experience should tell us that war is obsolete. There may have been a time when war served as a negative good by preventing the spread and growth of an evil force but the destructive power of modern weapons eliminated even the possibility that war may serve as a negative good. Obama, he says, as a head of a state sworn, as a head of state sworn to protect and defend my nation, I cannot be guided by the examples of Gandhi and King alone. 
I face the world as it is and cannot stand idle in the face of threats to the American people. Now, I actually end my chapter by looking at two other American presidents who won the prize when they were sitting presidents. Uh, I figured, take Obama at his word and check this out. Uh, and these two are Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. Now, it was interesting that Roosevelt, Roosevelt did two things. He waited until after his presidency's, presidency was over to actually accept the prize. And that might have been an example to follow. Uh, so when he gave his speech, he says, I speak as a practical man, and whatever I now advocate, I actually tried to do when I was the head of a great nation and keenly jealous of its honor and interest. In striving for a lofty ideal, we must use practical methods, and then he spells that out. But what Roosevelt actually says that uh, whatever he did, while I did not act officially as president of the United States, it was nevertheless only because I was president that I was enabled to act at all. Of course, he's not, wasn't black, so you know, give him some slack, I guess. <laughs> uh, and then I end with uh, Woodrow Wilson, who uh, clearly, he won the prize uh, for something that failed. Uh, he won the prize, the way it was stated, for his role in creating the League of Nations, but he failed to get his own country to join. Uh, he did not show up even to accept the prize, so his statement was read. But what Wilson said is, if there were but one such Nobel Peace Prize, I could not, of course, accept it. For mankind has not yet been rid of the unspeakable honor of war, horror of war, the unspeakable horror of war. It is the better part of wisdom to consider our work as one begun. It will be a continuing labor. In the ind indefinite course of the years before us, there will be abundant opportunity for others to distinguish themselves in the crusade against hate, fear, and war. In some ways, I think what Wilson was saying, that the prize, no one person is ever going to do enough to secure world, pe world peace. He tried, as president, to do something, and he accepted the prize, figuring that he had done a little iota, established the notion that we need a world organization so that you have some sort of a neutral platform to help in the struggle for peace. Uh, but he, he passed the baton on. I'm looking forward to Obama's post-presidency because I actually am convinced that once he leaves the White House, he will take the example of another president who won the, uh, the Nobel Prize long after he was president, and that was Jimmy Carter. That the platform of being a former president <laughs> will give him a chance to hopefully accomplish things that he may not accomplish before he leaves the White House. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Robinson. Of course, your uh, last uh, quote from President Wilson is very close to something that President Obama said in a recent interview with David Remick in The New Yorker, in which he spoke about being a runner in a relay race where he has a baton and that the most he thinks he can achieve will be passing in the river of history. That the most he can achieve will be passing the baton on to the next runner. So it's kind of very close to what you just had to say. And first of all, this is an absolutely wonderful chapter. Nobody else, to my knowledge, has tried to compare the three African-American uh, laureates, or including T.R. and Woodrow Wilson, the five Americans here uh, that you mentioned. So this is something, you and you can, it's not just a critique, if you will, of President Obama, but our own thoughts about the role of force, the use of force in international relations. Uh, 
if any. So you can all continue to mull that over. Well, our third speaker, as I already said, has written this absolutely marvelous chapter on Martin Luther King Jr. and his role. Uh, so please, uh, Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I am <clears throat> very happy to be here with you today. I will try not to let <clears throat> the cold, which is trying to grip me, um, be too evident. But I'm also very proud of being a part of this <clears throat> wonderful important book that Ade put together. Uh, I'm also happy to um, <clears throat> see Warren Hogue again, who Warren and I worked together at both the Washington Post and the New York Times in another life, and uh, it's always good to see Warren. My brief remarks are organized along four points. One, that Martin Luther King Jr. came along, historically speaking, at the right time. Two, that he represented the post-World War II black freedom struggle better than any of the many other movement heroes from Ella Baker to James Farmer to Stokely Carmichael to Daisy Bates to Rosa Parks to John Lewis to Fannie Lou Hamer to Medgar Evers to Roy Wilkins to Whitney Young. That list is a very, very long one, but King was the best representative of them all. Three, that his last four years, <clears throat> when he rejected the seductive allure of establishment acceptance, as well as criticism from a growing number within the movement and kept moving ever leftward, were his finest hours. And finally, that he was taken via assassination from the world at just the right moment to both free the black freedom struggle from the hindrance and I use that word advisedly, of his physical presence, and to ensure his legacy would endure to provide that struggle inspiration for the difficult days ahead. Finally, at the very end, <clears throat> I'll briefly discuss why Nelson Mandela's death should remind us of one of the powerful legacies both men left the world. Also, in the interest of full disclosure, I should reveal what Ade and Paula know I have a direct historical connection to King. I grew up in Boston in the 1960s, where the civil rights movement there was directly connected to the movement in the American South and in the throes of its own struggle to desegregate the Boston public schools. As a teenager, I attended the Baptist Church, 12th Baptist Church, where King was co-junior pastor in the early 1950s, while at theology school at Boston University. His colleague as junior pastor and great friend, Michael Haynes, would become my primary mentor <clears throat> as a teenager. And there does exist a picture taken in the fall of 1965 of me standing in the very small minister's office at 12th Baptist Church, right beside Martin Luther King. Now to the point that King came along at the right time. <clears throat> This is obvious when one considers both the post-World War II rising to power of the anti-colonial movements in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, and the spread in mass terms of what my college tutor, Professor Martin Kilson, calls the challenge demeanor dynamic among black Americans. That was the quiet, unshakable determination among blacks in the North and South that after the Second World War, they were finished enduring racist laws and racist customs which had the force of law. That attitude, which had been expressed in A. Philip Randolph's threat of a march on Washington in 1941, and in the Double V for Victory campaign blacks discussed during the war, led directly to the Supreme Court's Brown school desegregation decision of 1954, and the mass action phase of the black freedom struggle, the civil rights movement of 1954 to 1968, that came fully into being the following year with the Montgomery bus boycott. This was the fruition of what I call black Americans recovery from Plessy, the Supreme Court's infamous decision of 1896, effectively validating racism as the law of the land. That devastating decision had demanded, <clears throat> as the great W.E.B. Du Bois saw, that blacks amid the wrenching transformations of the modernizing world actually consider the question, were they inferior? He memorably described one byproduct of that consideration 
In his 1903 classic, The Souls of Black Folks, The Souls of Black Folk, as black Americans double consciousness and put the question that every individual black American and blacks as a group must consider in blunt terms. How does it feel to be a problem? Black's great achievement over the course of the next five decades was to expand the definition and use of double consciousness. It became not only a tool of self-diagnosis, but also a means of examining white America's attitudes and behavior as well. In other words, black Americans refashioned double consciousness from a burden into a compass and a gyroscope to study themselves and plot their course along the 70 year trek from Plessy to the civil rights victories of the 1960s. That transformation merged with their commitment to nonviolent political reform and what is hardly ever acknowledged, a fervent allegiance to America itself to produce the extraordinary mass discipline, stoic courage, and self-sacrifice that astonished the world. In that regard, it's important to remember that King became the leader of the Montgomery bus boycott only because the longtime activists there pushed him forward as their public spokesman. Before I discuss King further, let me say that, of course, there were other forces that helped bring the movement into being and aided its success. These included America's post-war global dominance, the coming of age of baby boomers, and of that cohort of Americans born during the early years of the war, who influenced mightily by the drive for profits of the nation's consumer capitalist sector would grow up believing they deserved to have what they wanted. The broader social consciousness ferment of the era that would produce in the early 1960s, such call to arms books as Michael Harrington's The Other America, Rachel Rachel Carson's The Silent Sea, and Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique. The development of television as a crucial medium to fill the American public's new hunger for news which leads to the final point on this list, the election of John F. Kennedy as president of the United States. Kennedy's use of television, both during his long campaign for the White House and during his presidency, (coughs) ushered in the age of television journalism as we know it. That's important in its own right, but it's also important because television played such a crucial role in making the civil rights movement what it became. That's because the movement in the South provided such great television theater, stark set pieces of good and evil and literally black and white with horrific examples of violence. Thus, it was the civil rights movement, not Vietnam, that became America's first living room war. King fit perfectly into this era, not only because he was a preacher, And blacks and whites, for different reasons, then were comfortable with the concept of a preacher as Negro leader, but also because he could and did speak to and for the people. He wasn't the movement's organizational leader nor its tactician, but its chief national and international spokesman. Using that rich baritone and big words and concepts some of us had never heard before, he could turn emotions into words and words into emotions that were otherwise inexpressible. In a movement overflowing with powerful speakers, both rough hewn and smooth, King was the best. Further, King with his powerful oratory and that aura of erudition that fit him like a glove was the perfect counter to the white man standing opposite him across the color line blocking the path to the federal government's fully committing itself to the freedom struggle. Not George Wallace, not James Eastland, or any of the other segregationist leaders. I'm speaking of the man who could be described in historical terms as King's fraternal twin, John F. Kennedy. It was JFK who perfectly represented the white Americans who, in terms of the movement's progress, counted those who were largely ignorant of or indifferent to the evils of racism, the racism that blacks endured, or were immobilized by the seeming impossibility of defeating the white South, the white South rabid racist culture. 
but who could be moved. It was the movement's task to show them all that ending Jim Crow couldn't wait on their political and psychological convenience. King couched those demands most often in the universal, high-sounding lexicon of morality, justice, peace, redemption, and brotherhood, of America rising to live out the true meaning of its creed, that engaged the sense of decency of many beyond the boundaries of black America. JFK fully committed himself to the movement's primary legislative goal just before his time on earth was up. And Lyndon Baines Johnson, the great fixer, astutely used Kennedy's martyrdom to expand that legislation and get it through a recalcitrant Congress. And then things got complicated. The stunning black rebellion in the Watts ghetto of Los Angeles occurred within a fortnight of the signing of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, ushering in a wave of long, hot summers that would leave many northern inner cities scarred for decades. That plus the continuing racist violence against the movement in the South seemed to prove that both the concept of nonviolence as a tool of advancement and King himself were passe. But King's commitment to nonviolence grew deeper in the late 60s period of extraordinary turmoil as the ghettos were exploding, as Stokely Carmichael's call for black power resounded throughout black America and to a far different effect throughout white America, and as King came openly to oppose the American war in Southeast Asia, a stance which also produced a virtual break with Roy Wilkins of the NAACP and Whitney Young of the National Urban League who were stalwart Johnson partisans. I say these years were King's finest hours because they were the years when he withstood the greatest challenges, his rejecting the seductive post-Nobel Prize blandishments of the establishment, his not surrendering to despair over his organization's declining treasury and influence, and his own virtual poverty, his fighting off knowing that J. Edgar Hoover's FBI was tracking him, and had via wiretaps and visual surveillance irrefutable proof of his compulsive philandering, which Hoover was always threatening to release. Despite all of this, King fully accepted his historical role as the great challenger of the status quo and of reforms that are no more than markers of the unfinished business yet ahead as the great civil rights acts were, excuse me, King was willing to stand against the world to prove that the revolution that would transform the fundamental injustices of American life and end the use of violence as a tool of government and relations between peoples was still worth pursuing. And so at the end of his life, he was where he had begun his public career a short 13 years before, trying to organize a national interracial mass movement, the Poor People's March, and lending his weight to a local movement of poor black people, the Memphis Sanitation Workers Strike, seeking economic and social justice. Martin Luther King's words and courage in confronting seemingly overwhelming power while resisting the powerful lure of resorting to violence is the reason he remains so compelling a figure to so many today. That is in part what King and Mandela have in common their large-souled humanity. That comes from, as President Obama said of Mandela in December, their having earned their place in history through struggle and shrewdness, through persistence and faith, and by showing us what is possible, not just in the pages of history books, but in our own lives as well. President Obama closed his eulogy, excuse me, <laughs> Close his eulogy of Mandela with these words, but you can see how well they fit Martin Luther King Jr. as well, and how deeply rooted they are in the concept of nonviolence. King challenged the world, King challenged the world with to the very end of his life. The president said, There was a word in South Africa, Ubuntu, a word that captures Mandela's greatest gift his recognition that we are all bound together in ways that are invisible to the eye, that there is a oneness to humanity, <clears throat> that we achieve ourselves by sharing ourselves with other, others and caring for those around us. 
I think at that moment, Martin Luther King Jr. <clears throat> was nodding his approval. Thank you. Well, hearing these words and reading the chapter are very powerful experiences. So, uh, you know, what Lee has given us was a kind of a recap of the chapter, but there's so much more in the chapter. And I, I again, sort of urge you to consider, not only consider, but to actually read these chapters, these three terrific chapters in a terrific book. Uh, not just about the Nobel Prize per se. So I want to open this up to a discussion. We've got uh, about 25 minutes here. So I'd like to welcome any of you who would like to ask a question or make a comment, a relatively brief comment, so we could come back to the panel one more time before we wrap up. So if any of you, uh, many of you were work for the UN or you work for various think tanks associated with the UN, so you've all thought about some of these issues one way or another in the past, uh, perhaps not exactly in these terms. Uh, so I'd like to see who would like to sort of weigh in here. So uh, and if you could, so let's take the lady in the back first and then Warren. Could you identify yourself, yes. your name and your organization? Yes, thank you. And speak up. Yes, thank you. I am Queen Mother Dr. Okay. Deloise Blakely, and I am the community mayor of Harlem and the ambassador of goodwill to Africa. I guess the question I would propose here is how do we include from civil society the young people who may be addressing the street peace they want and what, which they have spoken of? And how does that really relate to the Nobel Prize winners that has been discussed here today. Thank you. Great, and there's another lady there behind you wanted to speak to, is that right? No? I thought there was. No? Okay. Okay, so, sorry. So Warren, up here. Uh, Warren Hogue, uh, International Peace Institute. Um, I have a question uh, for you, Lee, that was put into my head by Pearl Robinson. When you were speculating about the fact that Obama might really come into his own once he's out of office, uh, and you mentioned Jimmy Carter. By the way, Jimmy Carter has a new book out today. I mean, he just doesn't stop. Uh, there's a full page ad in the New York Times advertising it. And it's very eloquent, as he is. Uh, but the question, um, you had me thinking about what would happen to somebody once he was gone from the scene, and then I heard Lee talk about um, the, the departure at a very young age. We forget how young Martin Luther King was when he was assassinated. And um, you must have thought about this. I know it's speculative. You think that had he lived, he would have been undone by the things like the Hoover tapes and all that? Or do you, you do think that? You don't think, to the contrary, he might have become even a larger figure than he turned out to be. So you'll get to answer. So would somebody else like to come in here? Uh, you, so Maureen, would you like to come in? And just to, again, please introduce yourself to everybody here. Hi, Maureen Quinn with the International Peace Institute. I'd, I'd really wanted to ask you to speak a little bit more about Ralph Bunch. I mean, you mentioned him in your remarks, but given um, uh, the, the, what little I've read about him or know about him, I think he's a fascinating figure. And what could peacemakers today learn from somebody like uh, Ralph Bunch? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, James, do you want to say? Hmm? Hmm? Yeah. So James, you want this is uh, Dr. James Jonah, who worked very closely with Ralph Bunch for many years in the Secretariat. Could you want to say something in response to Marines? Why don't you get up, James? Could you? I'm making you do a lot here. I'm making you speak, and I'm making you get up. Thank you. Uh, frankly, I, I, I don't want to speak. Why? Because of the question you have raised. Uh, I think that uh, had uh, Bunch be alive today, he could not understand the United Nations anymore. That, to me, is the tragedy of the United Nations, particularly the Secretariat. Completely. People don't know that 
Earl Bunch was not put there by the United States. Earl Bunch was invited by the Chinese head of decolonization, uh, and he was then released by the State Department to work for them. He was then, because of his performance, he was asked to continue. He was asked by Eisenhower, Kennedy, all of them to leave the Secretariat to join the, the government. He refused. And uh, frankly, I, I really don't want to express any controversial views, but when I listened a few weeks ago to the leaked uh, transcript of Victoria Newland, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Because here we have a senior US officials trying to manipulate the setting up of a government in a foreign country and then saying, oh, by the way, we have already arranged with the secretary to produce somebody who would lend his blessing. This is something which Bunch would have completely rejected. And I say it as somebody who was privileged to follow his footstep in creating the political department and then serving in that department. So that's why I say I don't want to, because uh, I don't think Ralph Bunch really could survive under these conditions. So thank you. So uh, th thank you very much. So I think Professor Robinson, who's writing a biography of Ralph Bunch, would like to add a few comments in response to your question. Now or? Well, why don't we do that now, and then we'll come to Lee and to Ade. Any other comments here? Well, actually, in response to your question, I was going to turn to James Jonah. But um, I have been, I, I did not have the, the, the privilege of knowing Ralph Bunch, but I will say that his granddaughter, his oldest granddaughter, went to Tufts and was one of my students. It's, you know, you meet a lot of interesting people if you teach. <laughs> uh, but I've been following and looking for him, really doing archival research uh, in uh, tr trying to find out what made this man. And he, uh, people may know he got a doctorate in uh, government from Harvard, his dissertation on um, French colonialism, won the be prize for best dissertation in government, and afterwards Harvard actually st uh, established a new subfield within international relations, the government of dependencies. But he was not satisfied and decided to study anthropology as well. And what you read in the biographies is that he uh, went to Northwestern and studied, studied with Herskovitz, and he went to LSC, Malinowski, then South Africa. So I've been actually looking at these archives to try to figure out what he did. I now know he did not study with Herskovitz. What he was looking for in anthropology was one, how to understand people in government. But he was also looking for theories. And the theory that he finally said, this is what I've been looking for. He found with the Manchester School, uh, the idea, and this gets back to the situational thing, that he was trying to figure out a theory that didn't just study Africans in Africa or the big powers in the big power, but put them all operating in a system that was interrelated. And how one understands the perspective of each person, group, or entity as it relates to this larger system. And I actually think, I mean, uh, I, I haven't followed it all through. I haven't had a chance yet to interview Jonah. But what I actually think is that he took that perspective that he got from studying anthropology, sociology, and he took that to diplomacy. So this example, uh, increasingly what I see is that in negotiating, you need to understand the perspective of every party, partner, or party that's involved in the, the negotiation, but you also need to figure out how they're going to relate to each other. Um, and so I, I, that's kind of what I think shaped and informed his approach to diplomacy. So we have uh, two more questions here, the question from the lady about youth and the role of these Laureates, would you like to ask a question? Why not the gentleman there? Uh, and then Warren's question, so we'll come back to you, all of you to answer those points. 
Great, uh, thank you very much. My name is Kenneth Johnson, principal of Devconia, which is an international private sector uh, development firm focused in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I'm, this has been wonderful. Thank you very much for a, a delightful presentation, uh, which was a wonderful retrospective. Uh, I'd like to pivot, if I might, to the future. What do you see, or who do you see are the future leaders especially in Africa going forward, given the fact, and speak to this um, from the point of view that there are emerging threats, uh, and what I would call the most existential threat now, which is the growth of uh, radical groups, <coughs> whether it be um, Boko Haram in northern Nigeria or Al-Shabaab in the east. How do we address that in terms of a peace framework, and how do we address the issue of very uh, entrenched unemployed, lack of opportunity that exists on the continent for the youth. So, uh, yes, you, why don't you, you have a question also, please. The gentleman behind Anne here. Would you identify yourself too, please? Yes, sir. Uh, William Awinado Kanyirige, Deputy Permanent Rep of Ghana, and uh, a brother to uh, Adeke. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I just wanted to begin by recalling about a year ago, uh, because of Ralph Bunch, uh, we do some work with the Global Center for R2P, which is located at Ralph Bunch. So I was, uh, um, uh, what is it, encouraged to Google and try to get uh, African uh, Nobel laureates. And that is when I realized that uh, some work was needed in this area. Unfortunately, Adeke never <laughs> shared with me that there was um, um, uh, work in progress. Um, so congratulations for this very important uh, project. Uh, I also want to quickly add that uh, uh, Adeke, suddenly this evening, looking at you, you uh, begin to assume the aura of Gandhi, um, <laughs> with an uh, African, uh, uh, yeah, Afro-Indian uh, look and uh, a bespectacled look of Gandhi. Um, uh, uh, but having said that, um, what I pick from the powerful presentations is that the organizers of the Nobel laureate, uh, one of the most uh, strategic or um, innovative approaches was to have awarded President Obama the Nobel Peace Prize, by which a message was clearly indicated that we impose on you, we impose on you. Um, and uh, this is very forward looking. And I just hope that the Nobel Peace uh, organizers will continue in that regard, in addition to rewarding people who have already taken action. And in relation to that, to ask uh, my friend Adeke, uh, the award to our senior sister, uh, Selif Johnson, and the, uh, uh, the peace needs of Liberia, don't you see it within the same context that there was also something strategic about that I mean, I mean, award? And then finally, and in relation to the question my brother asked, um, national infrastructures for peace is one of the emerging I mean, concepts to address that. And in Ghana, for instance, we are the National Peace Council, which is complementing the traditional National Security Council, National House of Chiefs, and other uh, state um, uh, and non-state organizations. And um, uh, to add that, we should also replicate the Nobel Peace Price, especially in Africa, at the continental, sub-regional, and national levels. And I would like to ask my brother, can you help us to conceptualize a framework in that I mean, regard? We are already thinking about something like that in Ghana. Sorry so uh, <laughs> so uh, one, one thing to say is anything Ade says he's going to do, he always does. Always. So this book is full proof of that. Because uh, this was in his dream a few years ago. I remember the discussion extremely well. So and here's the book. So we got one last question from the lady there. Final wrap-up remarks by the panel, and we're going to end by quarter to three, which is on the program. So a short question. Hi, my name is Tony Blackman. I've done an extensive amount of work on the continent as a cultural ambassador for hip hop and I'm an artist, and I've done a lot of cultural diplomacy work with hip-hop, and I've seen a lot of young people who are very frustrated with the leaders, 
what they call so-called peacemakers and with this idea of how revolution and change is going to occur. And it's tied to what um, Mr. Johnson was asking about, what does the future look like? What does the future peacemaker look like? And who's mentoring them and who's willing to mentor them? Um, because I work with a lot of my peers and, and they're not happy campers and they're losing hope. Okay. So several questions here about the future, which There's of another course. Woman with her hand up. I guess it's too late. Where, where is that? I see her right through here. Is there one more question yeah. here? Hmm? It's very brief. Yes, it will be. My name is Nkechi Obodo, and I'm the founder of Kechi's Project. Uh, Mr. Adabejo, I am a big fan of your work. Um, the question I have for you is, do you have any, have you considered going into politics in Nigeria? Oh, please. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go in reverse order. Lee, uh, Daniels, Pearl Robinson, and then you get the last word. So please. Um, a, a response to a couple of the questions. Um, one regarding King's um, immediate future, that he, he, he was taken from us at the right time. I do believe that um, King would not have had a good couple of years. Um, uh, and I will take the tapes, I will take the compulsive philandering last, but uh, if one considers when Cesar Chavez died, what was it, five years ago, six years ago? How many people said, gee, I thought he died a long time ago? Yeah. Right. Um, the, the way things were trending, um, King, what I meant that King was a hindrance was that uh, the movement was moving away from him. Uh, the concept of black power, and not the boogeyman concept of black power, but blacks seeking uh, power without the, seeking power uh, and the use of nonviolence without its moral suasion aspects, which is to say the vote, right? Taylor Branch has that wonderful um, prologue to, um, to uh, the last book, uh, at Canaan's Edge, where he talks about nobody realizes the vote is the ultimate instrument of nonviolence in a, in a democracy, right? Once blacks got the vote, that put a challenge to King's use of nonviolence, which was stand there and take it, right? Um, blacks had had that up to there. Um, so th that would have militated against him, but King led black people to the point where their political engagement was extraordinary. If you think of that period from 1965 to 1972, extraordinarily turbulent times, but of course that set the stage for Barack Obama. There's just a direct line. But even in that particular period, within seven years, we had Shirley Chisholm running for the presidency. And she said she was running not as a black candidate, not as a woman candidate, but of course all those things were mixed in. But black people just enormously jumped politically. King, <laughs> in a sense I can't go into, it's too long, would have been a hindrance to that, right? Because black people were after pragmatic, just power seeking, period. Um, then there is the, the tapes. And uh, it was not until, the, the, the instructive comparison is John F. Kennedy, right? It was not until the mid 70s that the, the information about Kennedy's philandering, reckless philandering, came out, right? 76, the church hearings or whatever, I can't quite remember, but um, in the mid-70s, all the stuff about Kennedy came out. So we were still in that innocent period when, in 1964, Nelson Rockefeller's uh, attempt to capture the Republican nomination founded on the fact that he divorced his wife and married Happy. 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 Rockefeller, right? We were still in that period. And so for, for the tapes to have come out about King's reckless philandering, it would have enormously not only damaged him, it would have damaged the movement, right? So um, on, on the point about role modeling, basically, where are the peacemakers coming from? Where are those people for um, the youth to grab hold of? Uh, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not pessimistic because there's always an answer. <laughs> an answer always turns up. And in some, to some degree, 
you cannot predict where that answer will come from. Because who's ever going to make the answer is, is, not, um, is not visible until they're visible. Nobody would have taken Martin Luther King in 1952 or 1953 as the leader of the movement. He was a bourgeois, black Baptist preacher of a particular type. Um, and, you know, he was going to Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery not to lead a movement. King was looking forward to pastoring for a while and then teaching. <laughs> That's what he was looking forward to. The events took him as they took everybody in the movement. And so what's coming, what young people have to look forward to, first of all, they have to look in their own communities, right? That's where the answer is in, the, in those terms. Growing up in Boston in the 1960s, I looked in my own community. There was Martin Luther King, <laughs> who had been there, you know, four years before I got there. Uh, there was also Malcolm X, who had been there 15 years before I got there, both of whom were still present in the memories of a whole lot of people in Boston, right? Um, so that, that's the only answer I have to that. It's, it's in the communities, first of all. And then one never knows who people, who young people especially, take as their role models. You just never know who that's going to be. I mean, you, 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 it, it crosses all sorts of boundaries, all sorts of boundaries in racial terms and gender terms and whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, we're in, and I will close with this, we're in, and I was thinking of something Pearl said regarding peacemaking. We're in an extraordinarily turbulent period, aren't we? Both in the United States, where there is a need for a peace movement, in the United States and internationally. But uh, at least so far, it's always out of the turbulent period periods that progress comes. That's about all I have to go on. Wow. That's great words for hope, <laughs> turbulent period. I have just a couple of quick things. Uh, first to Queen Mother. Some, I guess about 15 years ago, uh, when I used to be on the board of Oxfam America, and we had a meeting at B'nai B'rith here in New York. They took us in the board room, and there were all these pictures of Jews who had won the Nobel Peace Prize. And we were there talking about something that had, you know, they were upset with something we had done in Nicaragua. But I just remember sitting in that room looking around and thinking, this is very intimidating because it's sort of like they had a whole lot more weight on their side. And so I've always fantasized about rooms that would have the pictures, enough Nobel laureates who were black, they could <laughs> fill up the walls. And now I'm hoping that somebody will come out with posters or wallpaper from this book. And you create some rooms in Africa and in the United States. This is a great Black History Month. Uh, gift to give to yeah. people, but let's get some of that wallpaper. And just for people to say, uh, they are people from the past, but for me, the, the, the task for young people would be find out who these people are, what they did, how they managed to do it, and what relevance does that have for what it is you're trying to do. The second thing I would say, again, about one doesn't know where the next leaders are, but they're actually people who are among their followers who know who they are. So my, my current in Africa uh, project is I'm working on a, a documentary about a um, Sufi Muslim women's movement and it's one female leader who is very charismatic and she has a model of female empowerment. I'm doing the movie, it's narrated in House of the Most Widely Spoken West African Language and my goal is to mass produce it and get these images of empowered uh, African women into African popular culture and Islamic popular culture. This is a woman who has created a women's movement at the grassroots in Niger that has over 200,000 members. They have branches in seven West African countries. About every three or four years, they have a big, uh, they call it a congre, a congress. It's, it's wrapped up in a Sufi rally, but the themes are public policy, 
P women, Islam, peace and sustainability, reconciliation, these themes that are the things that you know, the UN and big people are dealing. I have been to some of these, 3,000 rural women show up with elites, non-elites, uh, they sing songs and things, but there is a theme, women organize it, women are at the center. And when I first met her, I gave a presentation at the American Cultural Center in Niamey. They asked me, I'd been teaching in, in Tanzania for a year. They asked me to talk about women's movement in Africa, so I took three people. Um, to uh, a Kenyan, a Tanzanian, and Mama Chota. In that room, there was only one Niger, and these are the kinds of elites who were uh, invited to the American embassy for events. <laughs> there was only one person in that room who had ever seen Mama Chota's face. They said, oh, we've heard about this woman who's doing something there in the rural areas, but we've never seen her face. And when I met her, her daughter took me, she said, well, have you met my mother? And I said, no, and I came, and it was a big a religious holiday. And mother didn't have time. She says, but can you come back next week, next month? Our women's group is having a congrès. And I said, okay, what is that? She says, well, we're going to be talking about the role of Islam, Muslim women, the, the contribution of Muslim women to the World Bank's poverty reduction program for Niger. I was passed out. I'm a political scientist. I didn't expect these words to come out of the mouth of this Muslim woman leader who I thought was just doing religion. And I thought, well, sure, I'll come. She said, I'll tell me where you live. I'll send a car. When I came, there were 3,000 people. And the the... The first lady, you know, the president's wife was there, all the high-ranking women, the big, big traditional chiefs, the local administrators, but all of these women, it was all organized by women. And I said, what she's doing is political. I had been doing field work on politics in Niger for 35 years at that point, had never heard of her. So what studying who she is, what she's doing, and how she's done it convinces me she is not alone in Africa. Uh, and so what people need to do is get out there and find out who's doing what on the ground and give them some support. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just to respond to a few of the comments that I think uh, I can respond to. I mean, I think it's important to note that the Nobel Peace Prize has been quite an elite prize. It's not a prize that has been given a lot to grassroots people and uh, people that have waged those struggles. But in terms of the individuals that we've dealt with in this book, there are people like Tutu, Lutuli, and Mandelo, who obviously worked very closely with local communities in waging their struggles. And as Lee just noted, Martin Luther King also. Um, the two people that I think are important to single out are Wangari Matai, who was waging a civil society struggle. I mean, she basically got together rural women and mobilized them to plant trees and to be able to basically defend and fight for their rights. And I think also Lemak Bowie came out of a Western, uh, West African civil society movement, got together both Christian and Muslim women to fight for the cause of peace in Liberia at a very difficult time. So there has been a civil society element in some of these struggles we've talked about, but a lot of the others have been quite elite uh, struggles and elite individuals. Um, in terms of the crisis of youth, I completely agree with that point. Um, much of Africa's population happen to be youths. And that situation is only going to get, they're going to become larger and larger in the next 10 to 20 years. And that's what I think the Afro-Arab Spring was effectively about, where you have governments that are creating educational opportunities, but not able to follow up with enough employment opportunities. And those youths are trying to empower themselves, and there are many um, useful programs that you can point to in many parts of the continent where youths are actually trying to empower themselves. But 
I agree absolutely that the crisis of youth is something that we need to focus on going forward. Uh, but it's something you also need leadership for. And I think there's a crisis of leadership and a poverty of leadership, but not just in Africa, but around the world. These are pygmies that you see in much of the world at the moment. All the giants are gone. So I think that it's important also to try to find leadership that has vision and creativity, even in difficult situations. And that's perhaps some of the lessons we can try to draw from some of these Nobel laureates. I just want to say something briefly about Obama and uh, my brother William's point about giving it to Obama in some ways to force him to earn the prize. Um, I mean, I guess in some ways you can look at it that way, but I mean, Obama effectively got it because he wasn't Bush, right? And he had been nominated uh, for this prize in February, as early as February. And my question is really whether he has done enough to earn it. Uh, but I'm a bit skeptical just because the extraordinary rendition has continued, uh, because Guantanamo remains open, uh, because of the drones that I've talked about. I mean, he has done some good things, and maybe his heart is in the right place, but in the end, he's also been a servant of empire. So that's why I kind of have a bit of a problem with endorsing him. You know, about when Kissinger got the prize, I think there was a famous statement by somebody that this makes political satire obsolete. Um, and that's what uh, some of the reactions have been. And finally, just in reaction to my sister from Nigeria, um, whether I'll go into politics in Nigeria uh, or not, I don't think I have the temperament or the resources uh, or the inclination to do that. Though I believe politics can be an instrument for social change, I think some of us are probably more effective outside of the political institutions. Thank you. Well, we've... Uh... We, we, we've uh, we've uh, ended up here with new wallpaper and new hope as our <laughs> themes. And uh, thanks to the questions that were asked, uh, we're all tremendously indebted to the three of you, Ade, Pearl, and Lee, if I may. You're just wonderful. This is a fantastic book. I promised you a special event, and it has been a special event. So uh, let's give a big round of applause to our three. <laughs> <laughs>